If you like Academic Agent's content on this channel, sign up for a course on the Academic Agency. He's now offering Foundations of Economics. Click the link in the show description and level up your econ knowledge. Well, hello, boys and girls. It's been a while since I've given you a stat attack. So strap yourselves in because I'm going to be dropping some numbers. You may want to go and get yourself a pen and paper because these facts are going to be hitting you thick and fast. And I don't have a graphic for every single fact I'm about to drop. First, let us look at welfare spending. Between 1965 and 2000, the US government spent $8 trillion on welfare programs in constant 2000 US dollars. That means this graph that you're looking at here has been adjusted for inflation. 40% of the recipients of these programs were black, who represented 12% of the total population. 30% of the recipients of these programs were white, who represented 70% of the total population. So you can see that the recipients uh, were disproportionately black and the net contributors were disproportionately white. It does not take a genius to figure that out. Now expressed as a percentage of GDP, welfare spending increased from 1.2% in 1965, when Lyndon B. Johnson declared his war on poverty, to 4.4% in 2000 under Bill Clinton. Now, my source runs out around the year 2000 here, so a lot of the facts and figures I'm going to be sharing are about 20 years old, although I have taken the liberty to see what happened after 2000 uh, and the trend continued as you can see in fact it uh, it went wildly out of control after 2000 welfare spending increased from 4.4 percent of GDP in 2000 to 7.2 percent in 2010 that was under Obama uh, in response partly to the to the uh, economic crisis of 2008 and then it rose to 9.03 percent under Donald Trump in 2020 annual US government outlay on welfare in 2021 is $2.6 trillion. Now, so you can compare it to the previous set of stats, I've adjusted it for inflation, and in 2000 US dollars, that is $1.65 trillion. If the outlay on welfare between 1965 and 2000 was $8 trillion, dollars in constant 2000 USD then between 2001 and 2021 it was at minimum over 16 trillion dollars in constant 2000 USD this means that from 1965 when the war on poverty started to 2021 the US government spent in excess of 24 trillion dollars in constant 2000 USD and I did check 40% of welfare recipients in 2021 are still black so that percentage has not changed hasn't done the needle hasn't moved at all now I did share some of these statistics before and some bright spark on Twitter piped up and said oh but look AA this graph these graphs that you're showing don't adjust for population. Well, let me just tell you something, Einstein. The population of the USA has not increased by 10 times since 1965. And the purpose of expressing these statistics as percentages of GDP is to adjust for these sorts of things. So the fact that the population has increased doesn't mean anything. Uh, when we're considering these ridiculous increases in welfare spending. Now, these statistics I'm going to uh, be sharing with you compare the white non-Hispanic population of the USA 
with the black population because the stated goal of a lot of these welfare policies from 1965 onwards was to address some of the gaps that exist between the white and black populations in everything from poverty to educational attainment rates to health care. And spoilers alert, despite all of these trillions of dollars being spent, hasn't made an iota of difference to the bottom line. Not at all. Let's start with the labour force participation rate. You can see in 2002, 68% of the black population participated in the labour force. This has decreased to 60% in 2021. Um, and as you can see from this graph, obviously the pandemic uh, is some part of that story, as was the 2008 um, uh, economic crisis, but there's been an 8% drop in the labour force participation rate uh, for uh, the black population and then for the white population in 2002 there was 73%, uh, so it was higher than the, the black uh, population uh, just about, um, but then that has decreased uh, to 61% in 2021 uh, and again the pandemic is part of that story. Uh, but the drop has been sharper for the white population. So, if anything, uh, the welfare policies have actually succeeded in equalising white and black when it comes to labour for force participation, but it hasn't uh, levelled up the black population, as Boris Johnson might say. It's actually just levelled down the white population. If we have a look at the unemployment rate, this has been reasonably constant. In 2002, uh, the black uh, unemployment rate was over twice the white uh, unemployment rate and in 2021 that remains the case. Uh, it's come down a little bit. Um, I mean as you can see from these graphs it did but Donald Trump was not lying when he said that he had historic uh, low black unemployment but the pandemic has kind of wrecked that um, so it's right back up to 9.2 percent whereas the white unemployment rate has recovered uh, to being 4.8%. So again, we're looking at, you know, around um, twice the unemployment rate among blacks uh, versus whites. But these figures conceal uh, some bigger uh, gaps. The poverty rate for black women, for example, is more than twice that of white women, 25% compared to 9%. The poverty rate for black children under 18 was three times greater than for the similarly aged white children, 30% compared to 10%. The poverty rate for blacks 65 years and older was more than three times greater than for similarly aged whites, 16% compared to 5 Black families were more than three times more likely to have incomes below the poverty level than whites, 21% compared to just 6%. And again, I stress decades of welfare spending, trillions and trillions of dollars, affirmative action programs, social engineering, um, anti-discrimination laws. None of them have made an iota of difference to any of these figures. If anything, in almost every case, the trends have worsened. Um, and if anything has changed at all, it is that the white population has come down rather than the black population having improved across the board. Now, you can check some of these facts in real time as I'm reading them. Um, and if you're interested, uh, it might be a service to other people if you want to look up, you know, where has a specific trend gone uh, since 2002? Um, I, in the checks that I did, in almost every case, they've got worse rather than better. So let's have a little look. By Foundations of Writing on the Academic Agency. To write clearly will help you to think clearly. The ability to communicate ideas in lucid prose is foundational to success in many areas, and it is a basic requirement in every walk of life. You will learn the parts of speech and come to understand the core functions of the English language, sentence construction and syntax, punctuation, style, and common mistakes. Once you see how mistakes are made, you will not unsee them.
you will know for the rest of your life. Foundations of Writing. Buy it now. Black infants are three to four times more likely to be dangerously underweight than white infants. Black infant mortality is more than twice the rate of white infants. Black infant mortality due to sudden infant death syndrome is three times greater than for white infants. Mental retardation is more common in black children than in white children. Blacks are more likely to experience a mental disorder than whites. Blacks suffer isolated sleep paralysis, an inability to move while falling asleep or waking up, and are likely to experience a sudden collapse, sometimes preceded by dizziness more than whites. Blacks have the highest rate of asthma of any racial group. The asthma rate for blacks is more than 23% higher than for whites. In 2001, an estimated 3 million blacks had asthma. Blacks are three times more likely to be hospitalized for asthma than whites. Blacks account for nearly 26% of all asthma deaths. Black children are five times more likely to die from asthma than white children. Blacks are eight times more likely to contract active tuberculosis than whites. In 2001, blacks accounted for 30% of tuberculosis cases. Blacks are more likely to develop and die from cancer than any other racial group. Blacks are 20% more likely to die from cancer than whites. The five-year survival rate for cancer among blacks diagnosed from 1986 to 1992 was 44% compared with 59% for whites. Black men are over 1.5 times more likely to develop prostate cancer than white men. Black men with prostate cancer are two to three times more likely to die from that disease than white men with prostate cancer. Black men are at least 50% more likely to develop lung cancer than white men. The mortality rate of cancer of the lung and bronchus for black men is almost 34% higher than for white men. Black women have the highest incident rates of colon, rectal, lung and bronchus cancer as well as several other types of cancer. The mortality rate for black women is higher than that of white women in breast cancer, lung cancer, uh, heart disease, chronic obstructive uh, preliminary diseases. Black women die from cervical cancer at least three times the rate of white women. Death from colorectal cancer for blacks is 30% higher than for whites. The rate of diabetes for blacks is 70% higher than for whites. The prevalence of diabetes in black men is 85% higher than in white women. 15% of black women have diabetes, but only 6.9% of white women. Blacks are five times more likely to develop uh, glaucoma than whites. Blacks are twice as likely as whites to suffer from high blood pressure. Kidney disease is 18 times more common among blacks than among whites. Blacks of ages 25 to 44 are 20 times more likely than their white counterparts to develop hypertension-related kidney failure. Blacks account for 29% of people treated for kidney failure. Blacks have more than twice the incidence of end-stage renal disease than whites. Black women are twice as likely as white women to have strokes. In 2000, death from stroke was 40% higher for blacks than from whites. Death from cardiovascular disease is 30% higher for blacks than for whites. Black women are three times more likely to contract lupus than white women. Black women with lupus are more likely to develop kidney problems than white women with lupus. Blacks are more than eight times more likely to develop sarcoidosis, which strikes vital organs, especially the lungs, than whites. The death rate for blacks with sarcoidosis is 15 to 17 times higher than for whites with sarcoidosis. In addition, blacks suffer higher rates and more chronic conditions than whites in diseases associated with an unhealthy or an unsafe lifestyle which has been documented by the American Diabetes Association, the American Heart Association, the American Lung Association, the Center for Disease Control, and the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. For example, homicide is the number one cause of death among blacks ages 15 to 24. In 2000, blacks were six times more likely to be murdered than whites. Blacks account for 38%. Of the more than 833% AIDS cases diagnosed since the beginning of the epidemic.
By the end of December 2001, more than 168,000 blacks had died from AIDS. The AIDS rate for black women is 20 times higher than for white women. Black children represent 58% of all paediatric AIDS cases. In 2001, black men accounted for 43% of HIV cases reported among men. In 2001, black women accounted for nearly 64% of HIV-1 cases reported among women. Decrease in AIDS mortality from 1999 to 2000 due to antiretroviral therapy was lower among blacks than for whites. Risky sexual behaviour was higher among black homosexual ages 23 to 29 than among comparably aged white homosexuals. Untreated AIDS kills blacks more rapidly than whites. Gonorrhea rates among blacks are more than 30 times higher than for whites. In 1999, blacks represented 77% of total number of cases of gonorrhea. Syphilis rates among blacks are nearly 30 times the rate for whites. In 1999, blacks represented 75% of cases of primary and secondary syphilis. Genital herpes diagnosed cases is more common in blacks, 45.9% having genital herpes, than whites, who have only 17.6%. Still pretty high, if you ask me. Uh, black women are at the highest risk for infection with herpes, HSV2. Black teenagers and young adults become infected with hepatitis B three to four times more often than white teenagers and young adults. Hepatitis C is two to three times more common in blacks than whites. Of the three leading causes of death for blacks, heart disease, cancer and stroke, smoking and other tobacco use are major contributors. Smoking is responsible for 87% of lung cancers. In 1997, black men... 32.1% smoked at a higher rate than white men, who had 27.4%. I'd be interested to see how those have changed, because smoking has come right down since um, since this was written. Blacks are three times more likely to smoke menthol cigarettes than whites. Smoking is believed to be responsible for between 20 and 30% of low birth weight babies and 10% of infant deaths. Death rates due to alcohol dependence syndrome are higher for blacks than whites. Incidence of fetal alcohol syndrome among blacks appears to be seven times higher than among whites. The injury rate for blacks is higher than that for nearly all other racial groups. Black teenagers are less likely than white teenagers to wear seat belts at all times, thereby increasing their risk of motor vehicle related injuries. Blacks have a higher rate of spinal cord injuries than do whites. The drowning rate for blacks is about 1.6 times higher than for whites. The drowning rate for black children ages 5 to 9 is 2.5 times higher than it is for white children of the same age. Blacks are the highest rated group among those at greatest risk for injuries from residential fires. The pedestrian fatality rates for blacks is nearly twice that for whites. Obesity is more common among black women than white women. 77% of black women are overweight and 50% are obese. Blacks are less physically active on average than whites. 44% of black men and 55% of black women are sedentary. Now the costs for treating all of these diseases fall, of course, disproportionately on the white population, despite, in some cases, the... Uh, rates being far higher in the black population. Uh, these were the costs. AIDS cost uh, the US taxpayer between seven and eight billion dollars in 1996. Arthritis, 82 billion in 1995. Cancer, 172 billion in 2002. Cardiovascular disease and stroke, 352 billion in 2003. Diabetes, nearly 132 billion in 2002. Obesity, 117 billion in 2000, physical inactivity 76 billion in 2000, poor nutrition 42 billion in 2000, pregnancy related complications about 1 billion dollars annually, smoking about 155 billion dollars annually. So you can see the, uh, even though you might say, well, it's very unfortunate that there are these uh, differential outcomes in health and in healthcare. 
but uh, you can see that even in 2000, the costs were disproportionately falling on the white population. And of course, since then, um, with the Obamacare, uh, Medicaid and all of that, um, I can imagine most of these figure, figures have more than doubled. Um, in fact, the massive outlays in welfare spending I outlined at the start of this video were um, really down to Obamacare. Uh, I think about a third of those increases were down to healthcare spending. And of course, the recipients of those uh, healthcare spendings um, are going to be uh, disproportionately um, black. Okay, so let's move on to crime. And as you can see here, um, I mean, I, I think a lot of people are going to be familiar with these sorts of stats. Um, you can see that the, the homicide rate for white on white and black on black uh, uh, violence is around the same, but um, yeah, there are differences in the black on white and the white on, on black. Um, the most shocking statistic here, uh, I think, is the uh, fact that around 10% of um, the black population in America were incarcerated. Um, in fact, 750 per 100,000 US residents, around 750 um, would be incarcerated compared with less than 100 in the white population. Um, as you can see from this graph, uh, about 2% of the white population are incarcerated compared with uh, 9 to 10% of the black population. Um, and the costs of crime uh, are astronomical. Um, 1996 reduced quality of life for the victims of crime about $450 billion. Uh, the cost of violent crime, 96, $426 billion. Rape, $127 billion. Assault, $93 billion. Murder, $61 billion. Child abuse, $56 billion. Medical expenses of those people who are incarcerated, $105 billion. Healthcare fraud, another billion dollars. Drug abuse, billion dollars in 2000. Cost of crime to insurers, $45 billion. And then it goes on and on and on. Um, I think the, um, the, now there may be th people thinking, well, yes, but this was 2000, you know, what's the situation looking like now? Um, I know for a fact when it comes to this topic, uh, crime, uh, in many places it's got even worse. Um, I mean, I, I would, I would have a look at, uh, what's been happening in Chicago, uh, New York, uh, LA, in the past 20 years and um you know i don't think you'll see a drastic uh, reduction uh, in any of these numbers um if anything uh, things have changed in the other way where they've actually made the law more lenient um so for example in parts of california i think in san francisco uh, you can actually shoplift up to a thousand dollars uh without uh, being charged um, they've also brought in bills which, um, which allow, uh, you know, zero dollar bails, uh, you know, so basically if you're caught doing various different offenses in certain blue states, uh, you just get released again. Uh, and we saw a lot of that last year, uh, when it, when it came to the, when it came to the riots. So, um, hopefully, uh, some of these, uh, facts were interesting. I call this video the American delusion and um, the overwhelming sense I get when I go through these statistics is that well a lot of the policies are predicated on the idea that the differences in all of these different outcomes and the differences in um, the performance of the various racial groups in America come down to environment. If you just clear away the environmental factors, everything else will equalize. If you if you mow down the barriers, if you change the law, even if you skew the law, uh, you know, towards blacks and against whites, then things eventually will sort themselves out. This was the thinking that went into 
the legislation brought in by Lyndon B. Johnson in 1965, it has continued to be um, the way that the U.S. administrations over the decades have thought about these sorts of issues. Um, in fact, it's got worse. We've seen, uh, you know, the wokeism and the social justice. And at this point, um, it's akin to Soviet-style Lysenkoism. I would suggest to believe that these, the one that welfare could ever be a solution to any of the problems uh, that I've talked about, and secondly, that these gaps across all of the, I mean, I, I must have listed about 100 or more different uh, racial gaps um, across many, many different metrics. I think it's a delusion to believe that they could ever be equalized, that they could ever, you know, that you could ever somehow come up with equal outcomes um, through social engineering measures. And in fact, as I've as uh, we saw, uh, if, if anything, the situation has been getting uh, worse for the white population as opposed to better for the black population as the white population start to adopt more and more of these kind of um, unhealthy behaviours, I guess, or uh, ways of living that aren't conducive to a healthy and prosperous lifestyle. And as we know, the left of consistently reacted by trying to make a point like that a taboo or to say well it's, it's racist to suggest that it could be down to any other sort of factor now as i have looked at this you know that situation all of those stats were written in 2002 the situation has become worse maybe twice three four times as bad since 2002 now in 2021 and it's difficult to imagine a situation where this is going to abate. Clearly, results do not um, change the way that people think about this issue. Clearly, the reality on the ground does nothing to change the way that the authorities uh, tackle these issues. And my honest feeling, uh, thinking about it, is that I think that this is going to cause the collapse of America in the long run. The inability of America to face this issue properly, uh, and by that I mean not in the way that the, the left talk about this issue, which is, you know, to say, well, this is all the legacy of slavery or it's all the result of racism or something like that, but in the inability of people, left and right, to come to terms with the fact that different groups of people are fundamentally different. They have different values, they have different ways of living, and they're not going to be made. You're never going to make um, one group of people adhere to the standards of another group of people, no matter how, how hard you try. Um, but then you shouldn't uh, forbid that group of people, uh, you know, in this case, white people in America, maintaining their own standards. You shouldn't try to, you know, uh, a lot of the critical race theory stuff is actually about demolishing the things that created prosperity in the first place for many Americans. And um, I think the inability of anybody um, in American politics, including Donald Trump and uh, anybody on television, like I, I, I doubt um, Tucker Carlson would touch this topic, for example, um, the inability of anybody to ad address this uh, nakedly, openly and honestly, I think will lead to the end of America in the long run. I mean, already America, as we know it, uh, no longer exists after what happened last year. Um, but I think that uh, the seeds of American destruction are right in all of those stats that I uh, have laid out for you uh, in today's video. So... Um, yeah, no solutions, only black pills, I'm afraid. Um, the only white pill I see in the horizon is that the destruction of America will be good for the rest of the world. I think it will be good for everybody else, um, you know, in Europe, certainly, to stop having to deal with the American disease, this American egalitarianism. You know, they've exported their own racial problems onto Britain and onto the rest of Europe um, 
and they're now trying to force all of us in these, you know, who do not have the same history, uh, who do not have a legacy of these sorts of issues. They're now trying to get all of us to adopt their stupid ways of thinking about this as well. And uh, if it's not stopped, uh, you know, it, like, if America doesn't like implode in on itself, then this American disease is going to end up killing all of Europe as well. So the only, uh, any, the only thing close to a white pill I have for anybody is hopefully we will get to the end point soon where the American system collapses and then at least maybe Europe can recover its sense of self um, and start to put the pieces of civilization back together. But there's not an unlimited time frame on this because the other end condition, of course, is the Chinese just taking over. On the bright side, I very much doubt the Chinese have these sorts of attitudes towards these issues in the slightest, so at least that would change. As ever, let me know what you think in the comments, and I'll see you soon. Now available at the Academic Agency. Sharpen your analytical mind and your argumentation skills with Foundations of Logic. The course draws on the ancient wisdom of traditional logic that students learned for over 2,000 years, from the time of Aristotle through to the medieval schoolmen right down to the 20th century. Sign up now for a free preview lecture. Be sure to like this video and subscribe. And if you really like my content, maybe consider joining the channel or donating or maybe even buy a mug. I am grateful for all of your support. Now get out.